one second left. Wait. Okay. You know, maybe I'm a little bit lucky because every now and then I get to have epiphanies. Every now and then, suddenly I have a clarifying moment where I know what needs to be done or I know what I want to do. And I thought I would be an academic and my first field was literature. But I got very interested in looking at the relationship between words and images. So instead of just studying literature, I started to study literature and art history. And when I was a university student, that was my field. And at a certain point, I started to realize that there was a glut, it was a practical realization that somehow there was a glut of great people wanting to be academics. And I thought, I'm seeing junior faculty who are teaching me who aren't finding positions in universities. And I thought I was pretty good, but I wasn't better than they. They were wonderful. They were great. And so I thought I needed perhaps to make a more practical decision about my future. And while I worked with words and images, with literature and art history, I had already started to shift more to art history. And I spent a lot of time in museums because it was part of my, of my academic program. And one day, it was in the spring of my last year as an undergraduate. I remember exactly that I kind of walked out of the dormitory where I lived and I was standing in the courtyard of, of where I lived and I looked up and I thought, maybe I should become a museum director. Well, it's a funny thing because where I grew up wasn't so beautiful, but I always had this attraction to objects of beauty. When I was ready for high school, I didn't stay home. I went away to a boarding school. And you know, in that period in time, you went away to a, a, a single sex school. So it was a school for boys near absolutely nothing. Most kids hated being there. I loved it because the landscape was gorgeous. And there was this fantastic architecture, which was all from the time right before the Civil War. So it was a certain kind of Pennsylvania architecture with field stone foundation walls and Pennsylvania brick on the exterior. And when you saw that architecture in that setting, it was just incredibly beautiful. And you know, I was a, I was a teenager. And, and this wasn't something that I realized later. This was something that I knew for the several years that I was in that school, that I simply loved being in the place. What happened to me at MoMA was that after two years of being there as an intern, the suggestion was that I stay, and I said, no, 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 I'm not ready to stop learning. I'm not, I'm not ready to feel that I've completed my studies and to start working. And they said, you know, what we can do is, for the next five years, every year we'll put you in a different part of the operation of the museum. And they did. So one year I worked for the director, one I worked for the deputy director. I did a year in finance. I did a year in a curatorial part of the museum. And so by the end of five years, I'd really had some experience in each aspect of how that museum ran. And then we started the redevelopment of MoMA that took place in the late 1970s and the early 1980s. At a certain point, I was put in charge of that project. And so of course, I was learning along the way, and I was following the counsel of really great mentors, but I was put in charge of realizing the redevelopment of MoMA. And so, in a way, there couldn't have been a better kind of training for someone coming up in the field to be prepared then to become a director and run a museum. When I was asked to come here, as you know, I'd never been to Israel before. Um, I think the museum had just passed its 30th birthday 
and was looking for a new director, and the decision was to see if it would be right to bring someone international here. Then I came to see the museum, and actually, this is almost exactly 20 years ago last month, and I arrived at the campus, and, and suddenly everything from what we've already talked about, about what I knew mattered in making a great, strong, and powerful museum came together. And I walked up Carter Promenade, and halfway up the promenade, I realized that this might be the most powerful museum setting in the world. And I had never had an epiphany as strong as the one that I had that day. And I looked at the combination here of the site, the setting, the landscape, the architecture, and the contents of the museum. But I saw very clearly then the potential that this place had to be different from any other museum anywhere that had a brief as broad as this one does. I'm, an, I'm a modern art historian and I'm a, an, a modernist architectural junkie. And, you know, MoMA is like a temple to international modernism that holds the complete narrative of the history of modernism and then leading to art in your own time. And there, I really thought a great deal about this whole point about the power of place. And it's not just what's inside, it's about the setting. And you know, Mar MoMA sits in a very tight urban setting, but it was then an amazing piece of international modernism as the kind of neutral backdrop inside which you would tell a story. And in that case, you were telling the story of modernism. So I arrived, and I went inside, and I had two little epiphanies. One was that in my entire sort of academic training, I always thought of 1850 as the platform. Everything that I thought about was related to what happened in 1850 and beyond that would enable the creation of modernism. I never looked under that platform. And all I had to do here was walk inside and see that there was a million and a half years of accumulated material cultural history that would inform 1850. And I was a little bit overwhelmed to think two things. One was that I'd never thought about that. And two, that here there was the potential to assemble all of that in an ordered way so that you could tell a narrative that started at the beginning of time and that came to, a pre to the present and that, and that wrapped around the globe. We can start with Mansfeld. Yeah. And you know, again, I didn't know this, but you could see it just by looking at what had happened here. It's not complex. It's actually very simple and straightforward. Al Mansfeld took an Arab village on a Jerusalem hillside and reinterpreted it using classic, modular, modernist architecture. And his idea at the time was that, you know, in the early 1960s, Israel could hope to build a museum of, of a certain scale, but over time it might have the ability to grow. And his view was that it would have the ability to grow in the same way that a village would grow. And so on the one hand, the idea is very simple, but on the other hand, if a village grows times 10, it becomes a little bit complex, and it's not necessarily so easy to see what the route of, path it, pa what the route of passage is from the point of entry to the point of departure. But you know, that's just the raw material that created the potential that we had the privilege to work with here. And in a way, Mansfeld is considered iconic here because it's not classic international modernism. It's international modernism adapted to the attributes of the site and the setting that we have in Jerusalem in the Mediterranean, with Mediterranean light and with the Mediterranean landscape. And so what makes it unique and what makes it special and frankly what makes it iconic in Israel is that it, it's exactly that kind of hybrid. So it takes international modernism from another place, 
but it adapts it to the specificity of this place. It's a funny thing because, as I say, it's a kind of perfect storm. It's not as if these three elements would ever have thought to be together. Yeah. But once they came to be together, and with hindsight, when you look at the synergy among them, it becomes incredibly powerful. Because Mansfeld, of course, is classic international modernism that migrated to the Mediterranean. You know, he was born in Russia. He was trained in Germany during the period of the Bauhaus. He came to Palestine in the period when that aesthetic was, in a way, what would become the defining aesthetic of modernist culture in Israel. And so that's one story. And Frederick Kiesler was an Austrian-born emigrate to America who came, in a way, by happenstance to work with Armand Bartos. The two of them were commissioned to design the shrine of the book to house the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it was actually a commission meant for Hebrew University. What they designed was considered eccentric. The university was less interested in being home to, to that architecture. And Teddy Kollek, in his classic brilliance, who had then nothing, really, for content in the museum, realized that by inviting the shrine of the book to the campus of the Israel Museum, the Dead Sea Scrolls would come to the Israel Museum. And in the way, the Dead Sea Scrolls for Israel are like the Mona Lisa for the Louvre. And so Teddy brought the shrine here, not because of an understanding or appreciation of Kiesler and Bartos's architecture, but because of his savvy in understanding the importance of getting the Dead Sea Scrolls to the Israel Museum. The architecture, on the other hand, is really, it's a kind of modernism, but it couldn't be more different from Al Mansfeld's classic international modernism. I mean, Kiesler, first of all, the shrine of the book is the only permanently executed project ever achieved by Frederick Kiesler. Most of his projects were ephemeral. They were constructed in a temporary way and they were dismantled. This is the only permanent example of his work. And his training wasn't really classic international modernism. He was about experiential, metaphorical modernism, a completely different strain. And here it sits on our campus. And then the third component is Isamu Noguchi. And Noguchi was a Japanese emigre also. Uh, he emigrated to the West Coast in, in, in America. And in a way, Noguchi was the first artist for whom land was his medium. In a way, he was an earth artist. And again, Teddy didn't pick Isamu Noguchi. Teddy was lucky enough to meet a man named Billy Rose who had a sculpture collection. Teddy wanted the collection. And Billy Rose said, you can have the collection on condition that Isamu Noguchi designed the garden in which the collection will be displayed. And so that's how Noguchi ended up here. And Noguchi came to this Mediterranean site and Noguchi's concept was to wash over that Mediterranean site a kind of Asian landscape which would be the setting for a display of the history of the modern Western sculptural tradition. And so it's a funny thing because Noguchi brings this kind of wash of another landscape from another place here to this hilltop in Jerusalem, and you know, Jerusalem is in Israel, and Israel is the land bridge connecting Asia, Africa, and Europe. And so to bring this kind of Asian wash to our landscape, and to bring classic international modernism, and then to bring experiential metaphorical modernism all to the same site and setting, again, it gives you this sense of universalism in the time in which the museum was created. And then that universalism of its moment becomes the backdrop for a narrative inside the museum, which is privileged to begin with prehistoric archaeology a million and a half years ago and come to contemporary art in our time. I don't think there's another place in the world that calls itself a museum that has this depth and this reach in the way that we have it here. 
people go to museums for different reasons depending on where they live in the world. Um, you know, going to museums in New York has become very popular because culture has made its way to the front page. And the more culture makes its way to the front page, the more people want to go to a museum because they just see it as part of the fabric of what their lives are about. Here it's a little bit of a different story. And you know, last, last year, almost a year ago, when we celebrated the International Council for our 50th anniversary, and Amal Saz spoke for us, and he started his speaking by saying that he looked, he very much looked forward to the day when culture would find its place on the front page of the newspaper in Israel. And it was a very moving statement because, in fact, culture isn't on the front page here. But we know why people come to the museum. And I heard it yesterday from all the families who were here for this celebration. People come to this museum because it's about looking at objects of beauty, but in a setting that is, is calm, tranquil, and itself beautiful. And there's something about coming into the campus of the museum and sensing this calm and this tranquility and this beauty, which is a little bit in contrast with what you find outside. And you know, you can think of it in two ways. One is just sort of the physical environment around us. You know, there's noise, it's noisy, it's visually cacophonous. And the museum is the antithesis of that. And if on top of the, the sort of simple enjoyment of beauty and serenity, you can learn from the experience of being in a setting like this, something about how your culture exists in a context which connects it to all of the other cultures that are around you, that's actually a pretty good thing. You know, the world's gotten really complex in the last few years. And if we were all smarter, we might have seen it coming, but we're not that smart. But it's here, and there's complexity. We're used to it in this region. But now that complexity is pervasive worldwide. And, and in a museum setting, and I'm not at the moment speaking only of ourselves, but in a museum setting, if your mandate is universal or encyclopedic the way that ours is, you're about preserving and protecting the history of cultural heritage. You know, we have currently this very modestly scaled exhibition of the only three bronze portrait busts of Hadrian that survived from the time of his reign almost 2,000 years ago. Yeah. And you know, Hadrian ruled during the most consolidated time across the broadest stretch of the Roman Empire. And it extended from Iraq all the way to Great Britain. And if you think today of the complexity across that same stretch of land from Iraq, Iran, Syria, all the way to Great Britain with the mass migration that is heading from the east to the west, and you think that it's the same spread of landscape, it adds another dimension to looking at these three bronze portrait busts of Hadrian and thinking about that landmass in his time and thinking about that landmass today. And those three portrait busts are being shown for the first time together. One is ours, one is from the British Museum, and one is from the Louvre. And this is exactly exemplary of what we are supposed to be about and what we and other museums around the world are supposed to be about in this time. It's to take these amazing treasures and lend them to one another and put them together in a setting where it can give clarity to a moment in a historical time that just might enlighten you about what's happening in your own time. And I think more and more that's becoming our mission. For better or worse, the museum <laughs> for better or worse, the museum and I have become 
No. For better or worse, I am very deeply identified with this place. So I can never separate from this place, and I won't separate from this place. You know, most museum directors don't have the privilege of coming to feel so intimately connected with their place. Mm. And I've had that privilege. 